Greetings to the afternoon group. Um, we're going to jump right in where we were. And we were talking theoretically about some problems in American education that are disproportionately affecting African American children. And I want to conclude this part by talking about what I call mantras. And this is what teachers say to me belief systems and we have to get rid of these belief systems if we're going to create schools that benefit all of our children and there are two mantras that I feel that educators have to get rid of the first mantra is that there's something wrong with the children and I don't know what has gone wrong in in-service education and all the sensitivity sessions that we have where we're supposed to be teaching people how to um, conceptualize children in the context of their culture and understand their challenges and all these things and it's just not coming out right the, the way the attitudes that people have and these are things that people say to me that the reason the children are not doing well in school is because there's something wrong with them like they have inferior minds and cannot perform well. And I want to share with you an experience I had as a consultant. I was invited to Port Gibson, Mississippi. This is a small town in Claiborne County. And the reason I was invited in is because the children in the school district were doing probably worse than anyone in America and they wanted me to look at how to close the achievement gap. Now, back in the day when black people were in slavery and in sharecropping, it worked for the power structure for black women to have 18 or 19 children. When I lived in Mississippi, I did some self-concept training for Head Start teachers, and I had the teachers to stand up and brag. These were black women. And I couldn't believe it. They stood up. I have 12 children. Everybody give them a big hand. I have 15 children. Big hand. 18, 19, 20 children. That's the only thing that they considered to be an achievement. So in that culture, black women having 18 and 19 children, that worked for the, the power structure because those children could go out and pick cotton. Well, in today's world, we have the mechanical cotton picker that can do the work of five people so we don't need people to pick cotton anymore and in that community everybody's on welfare everybody's getting food stamps and the white power structure recognized that these people on the dole they're not making any money they're you know have people in a welfare culture so they want to create a better educational program so that the children will stay there and help enrich the community, elevate a middle class where they can sell goods and services. The other thing that happened is when, when desegregation occurred, all of the white families pulled all their children out of the public schools and put them in the Christian Academy. So you have all black children, 100% black children in the public schools. The only difference between now and the old days is if you're black, you can go pay your money to go to the Christian Academy. You know, in old days you couldn't, now you can. All right. When I went into this community, uh, the only way you knew there were any men there is the women kept getting pregnant. Meaning nobody's married. Um, the out of, of wedlock teenage pregnancy rate was the largest in the country. And so I, you know, had a, a very uh, challenging task before me. So I decided I wanted to see what the genesis of the problem was. So I had every child in Head Start tested, okay, to see if it, what, what they look like in preschool. Uh, because it's Mississippi, because Mississippi is so poor, they have a lot of money, federal money, in Head Start. So by going to the Head Start centers, you get a real, you know, you have a lot, a very high proportion of the children are there. I had the children tested using the McCarthy scales of children's abilities. And 
it's kind of scaled like an IQ score. An IQ score, 90 to 100 is about average. Over 125 is gifted, okay? So I paid an examiner to test all the children in two Head Start centers. I could not believe the scores I got back. One center, the average scores were 108. Another center, the score, average scores, score was 113. Then I started looking through the individual scores of the children, and I saw scores 125, 126, 130, 131, 136. Then I noticed the children who were scoring all these high scores over 125 were all three-year-olds. The three-year-olds were scoring much higher than the five-year-olds. And I said, now anybody who feels that there's something wrong with these children, these children all coming from welfare families, uh, below the poverty level, and they're scoring like this? I said, these children are scoring higher coming in to Head Start than they're scoring going out. <laughs> then I went over to the school district and I had the director of testing pull all the scores for the children from kindergarten through 12th grade. Those children were on grade level from kindergarten through the third grade. When they got to fourth grade, they went two grade levels below grade level in reading and one grade level below grade level in math and sustained it all the way through, through the 11th grade. These data document a point I made in my second book. Black children do not enter school disadvantaged. They leave school disadvantaged. You understand? That there's nothing wrong with the raw material coming in. It's what happens to them in school. I spoke to a group of principals in Michigan, urban principals. Uh, at a conference they had. And after the talk, it was in the evening, we all went into the bar. So I walked past the table of one white woman who was with some other people, and she stopped me, and she said, that was so interesting what you said about uh, the children's scores coming in and how they were later. She said, I excoriated my fifth grade teachers because the black children were scoring so poorly in the fifth grade. And they said to me, well, these children came in behind. She said, you know what I did? I went and pulled those children's scores and records in first grade. They were all on grade level in first grade. And they almost died when they saw that. My point is, that's the assumption. The assumption is that the children can't learn much, so we won't attempt to teach them much. And that is a mantra, and we have to give that up. I have seen it. I supervise student teachers. I went in a classroom, and um, I noticed the instruction. You could tell what the, the assignment was on the chalkboard. These children were in the second grade, seven years old, and the teacher's teaching them the letters M and N. And she had them writing a whole page full of M's and N's. And then she had her sentence she put on the chalkboard, had them copying that multiple times. And I went over and talked to her about why she had this low level of instruction. I said, now, my son was four. These children are seven. My son was four when he learned the letter M. The teacher took a big piece of drawing paper and put an M on it and then asked him what did he know that started with an M. He said Mickey Mouse. He said okay draw a picture of Mickey Mouse which he did. Then he had him generate his own sentence and the teacher wrote his sentence on the paper and then my son copied his own sentence one time. Can you see that as a higher level of instruction? They're just copying M's and N's and copying somebody else's uh, 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 statement or sentence. And you know what she said to me? Well, these children are on free or reduced lunch. <laughs> Did she see it? So, these children are poor. Is there anything about that activity that a poor person can't do? 
Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, well, we have apartment dwellers. Well, a lot of our children are from single parent households. Well, we're doing the best we can with the population we serve. I hear this from black teachers, I hear from white teachers, I hear from everybody. And I'm saying something is wrong with our teacher training. <laughs> something wrong with our sensitivity workshops. If this is what we're coming out with. Okay, the second mantra is there's something wrong with the parents. That's the next one, that we're somehow misgetting, there's a problem with that. I'm here today to tell you that Ozzy and Harriet are not at home anymore. Okay? How many of you, even, how many of you don't even know who Ozzy and Harriet are? If anybody doesn't know? That's so funny to me. It is so funny. I've been saying that for years, and it never occurred to me that people don't even know who Ozzy and Harriet are. Have you all heard of Leave It to Beaver? Is anybody who has never heard of Leave It to Beaver? Uh, it's on Nick at Night. Okay, what about uh, the Donna Reed Show? Anybody hasn't heard of that? Oh, see, these are all stories, I mean shows that came in the 50s where you have this ideal kind of 1950 uh, American family. And the point I want you to get is the schools were crafted, schools as we know them, were crafted for this 1950s family where the mother doesn't work. And really, on most of these sitcoms, look like the father didn't work either. He's hanging around the house all the time, you know. And see, I know what an Ozzie and Harriet family is like because that's the kind of family I grew up in. And the biggest problem we have for educators is understanding that education is going to have to meet a different kind of family. Because we love the children who come from the Ozzie and Harriet families. My father was the pastor of a church and my mother, even though she had a college degree, did not work outside of the home. So my father would get up in the morning and he did calisthenics long before people told us we were supposed to do that. And I'll tell you this, he's 94 years old today, probably for that reason. But he would get up and do calisthenics, and then he went down to his office, which was about three or four blocks away. Well, by the time we had breakfast, Daddy came home and had breakfast with us. And so we all had breakfast together. In those days, when you went to elementary school, they did not have cafeterias at all. So everybody walked home for school for lunch. I mean, for my mother to get us to stay at school for lunch, you almost had to have a letter from a lawyer because there was no supervision of lunch and it was a real imposition for you to stay at school. Everybody walked home from school. When we walked home, Daddy came home too. So we all had lunch together. Then my mother took her nap. And uh, when we got home, she was getting up from her nap. She would get a cup of coffee. She would sit in the living room, and we would come in, and we would tell her what our day was like. And then she saw that everybody got home on time and didn't bring anybody with them. Then we'd go upstairs, do our homework. Daddy got home at 5.30, and dinner was at 5.45. Okay? Now, if that's not Ozzie and Harriet, I don't know what is. Every school we went to was about three blocks from our house, from kindergarten through 12th grade. My son is not li li uh, living Ozzie and Harriet, <laughs> and I don't know anybody uh, who is living Ozzie and Harriet today. Um, I'm ready. Stacy, where's Stacy? I, I, you want to turn this off for me? I can. Do I do? I just click it. Okay. Well, I'm ready for my first slide. I feel that part of helping teachers understand how to help at-risk children is understanding the changes in the family and understanding that we don't have the 1950s family anymore and trying to understand the children who are coming to school today and the points of misfit in our notions of parent involvement. 
we do not have a good fit, a good match between what we expect from families. One size does not fit everybody. And what's happening today is in the families where you don't have that strong mother, those children are at risk. And when I say that strong mother, I mean that mother who is economically supported so she can do all the things that the school feels that parents should do. I teach a course in multicultural education and we study 13 different ethnic groups. And the one thing I have noticed is when you talk about those ethnic groups where the, mo the children are doing well, like the Japanese mother, the Jewish mother, middle class Anglo mother, those are families where the man is earning the money and the woman can use most of her time negotiating the schools. Because even with African American families, even with African American families that are middle class, one of the problems is the black middle class woman has to earn half of the money covered in her household or more or more in order for that family to be middle class because of difficulties African American males face. And when that mother has to spend the corpus of her the focus of her energy earning money, she can't be over there being super mom in the school. And that is what is causing our children to be at risk. One of the things um, Dalton Conley, who is a sociologist, wrote a book entitled Being Black Living in the Red. And it's a really good book to read, Being Black Living in the Red. And it tells a lot of the truth that nobody wants to hear. You know, white Americans, when they think of African Americans, they want to think of Oprah Winfrey and Michael Jordan. You know, it's almost like when you have, uh, you put a relative in a rest home and you want to think they're happy. You know what I'm saying? So they like to focus on the, the athletes and entertainers who are doing well, and they want to try to make that the masses of African American people. And one of the things that Conley pointed out is that a white male is four times more likely, compared to a black male, to have a managerial job where he is earning $75,000 a year or more. Now, when you have that kind of earning capacity, that means your wife doesn't have to make as much. That means that she can not work, she can work part-time, she can work for vacation money, and she has the rest of her energy and sees her job as getting in that minivan and going over to the school. And one of the things I talk a lot about is when she gets to that school, she is joined by an army of well-educated, skilled white women who go in there and make that public school better than the private school. <laughs> now, this male who has that $75,000 a year job, he might have enough for his wife not to work. He don't have enough to send three children to private school, not with what they cost in Michigan. So her job is getting that minivan and go over there and make that school better than the private schools. I just want to give you a little example. I went to a school in Columbus, Ohio called East High School. That was an inner city, de facto segregated high school. Um, and I was talking to my mother one day, and she was talking about somebody who tried to get in East. And I said, somebody's trying to get in East? Who was trying to get in East? Oh, she said, I didn't tell you what happened to East. In the 50s, we had Mayor Sensenbrenner, who was our mayor, and he refused to let Columbus get broken up into small political school districts like everywhere else. Like, you know, in Cleveland, you have East Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, Beechwood. In, Mid in Detroit, you have Bloomfield Hills, Ferndale, Royal Oak, all those little places. Well, you know, they didn't start off like that. They broke up like that between the 50s and the 70s. Well, when people started trying to break up Columbus, he said, if you leave Columbus, I sell you no water. <laughs> you get no water if you leave Columbus. So Columbus is now the biggest city in the state of Ohio for that reason. 
you know, you didn't normally think of Columbus as big, but it's bigger than Cleveland, Cincinnati, everything, because Cincinnati would not let it get broken up. Well, in the 70s, when you had school desegregation, that meant everybody went to the Columbus Public Schools. So when the Supreme Court of the United States said the school should be desegregated, the Columbus Board of Education told everybody where to go to school. And they told white people they had to go to some black schools. And the white people got mad. And they uh, filed suit, and the suit went all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court of Ohio said, everybody's governed by the Board of Education for the Columbus Public Schools. Wherever they tell you to go, that's where you have to go. So when they got the final decision, they said, okay, we have to go to East. So they said, well, let's to go take a look at East. <laughs> Since we have to go there, okay? So they got in their minivans, and they all met at East. And they had a real nice uh, principal, black principal, very popular in the community. And they sat down with him, and they said, okay. Now, how many uh, National Merit Scholars came out of here last year? <laughs> I don't even know if he knew what that was, but the answer was none. And they went through their list, checking it twice. And he saw the handwriting on the wall, and he went into early retirement. And then they got them a new principal, and they went in there and transformed East into the highest achieving school in the community. And everybody's trying to get in East. My point, ladies and gentlemen, is those white women were the instructional accountability infrastructure in that school. Not the principal, not the teachers. I had two principals come and speak to my class. One was the principal, both were black principals, they're both black. One was principal in an inner city school, one was principal in a white suburban school. I just asked them, would they please talk about parent involvement and how it's structured in their, in their setting. I had no idea what to expect. I could not believe, my class could not believe it. The principal who taught at the black school, she talked about how they have an ice cream social, they have a father-daughter dance, they have a mother-daughter luncheon. I mean, it was a beautiful presentation, but most of the things she talked about were centered around social things, getting the parents into the school, blah, blah, blah. The black woman who was a principal at the white suburban school, she talked for an hour and a half, brought a print out on all the parent committees in her school. They had the math pentathlon, they had the Odyssey of the Mind, they had the Read to Me program, they had the science fair, the publishing center. I mean, she just went on and on and on to the point we were just flabbergasted. They had a meeting to oversee the gravel on the side of the building. They had a committee to oversee the playground. They had a committee to oversee all the committees. I mean, it was just unbelievable. We just, we were just floored. And what I mean, and I had my son in private school, and we didn't have all that. But what those women do is they come in there, and that's their focal point, giving their children the extras, and transforming that school. My point is, if we are going to have equal achievements for African American children, we're going to have to create and instructional accountability infrastructure in that kind of setting. Now James Comer's focal point, who is, you know, he's a child psychiatrist at Yale University and he has a school improvement program. What he tries to do is get poor black parents to come into the inner city schools and serve that function. And it's not working. I don't think, and I think we need to know when you can't take the same thing into a different setting. There needs to be an instructional accountability infrastructure, and I'm going to tell you what it is. That's a part of my model, but it's not going to be the same thing. Uh, there are reasons why it's difficult for African American women to do what white women are doing, and most of it's economic. I mean, I know my son goes to a private school. I can't go in there and do what w women do who don't work. I have to earn every penny that comes in our house. 
then I have to do everything the non-working wife does too. I can't do that. So even though I have the educational level and the skill level to do it, I'm too encumbered with trying to earn the money and raise my son. And that person who, uh, you know, is free and doesn't have to earn income is in a totally different situation. And that's what the schools expect. And so one of the key factors that I want you to get, we're going to have to change our conception of parent involvement. And we're going to have to adjust it to fit the existential needs of the children. And I suggest we have it wrong. I want you to look at, at this uh, cartoon on parent involvement that summarizes my point. <laughs> I wanted to use this in my book, Learning While Black, and I talked to the cartoonist to get permission, and she said she could not believe the reaction she got from that cartoon. And that's how parents are feeling, that there's a tip in the balance. And I'm going to tell you, not just lists of things. In raising, I have a son who's 17 years old, and it has been shocking to me what I call the pass back to the parents of actual instructional tasks. I mean, there have been too many instances where he has work coming home, and I'm doing it. And it's structured for me to do it. You know, it's not a matter, I mean, when the teacher sends it home, no second grade child could do this. I had uh, his fifth, gra fifth grade teacher assign him to write a paper and sent a packet home this thick for me to sign that I had read it on how to write the paper. I said, what is this? So no effort was made to teach him how to do it at all. But it sent home to me. I called the principal of the middle school and asked him, when do you all teach them how to write a paper? And he said, uh, ninth grade. I said, well, if you don't teach them to write a paper till the ninth grade, why are people assigning them in the fourth, fifth grades and all of this? So we have it wrong in terms of instruction. Now, this is the way the school feels. And then this is, now, so this is how the school feels, and the previous is how the parents feel. So there's a gap in terms of parent involvement and what we feel is the right mix, and this is my all-time favorite. <laughs> and see, when you have tasks structured that children can't do, with the thought that the parents are helping them, well, where is the equity? If you have one mother with a PhD and another one who can barely read and write, where's the equity for that child? How is that classroom being structured for fairness? Um, this afternoon, this morning, I ended my presentation by giving what I thought was the answer, and I'll just repeat it and make more and more comment about that. Uh, what I talked about this morning is I felt that we could fix what's wrong with education if we decided that our priority would be to have every child on grade level by the first grade and in reading and have every child in grade level by third grade in math because third grade is such an important year where you move through all the operations. And if that child knows what he's supposed to know in third grade, that's a foundation to build on. I also mentioned that I did a consultation in Richmond, Virginia, and they had a forum because the penal system in Richmond told them that the way they determine how many prison beds they will need in the future is based on the number of children who are not on grade level in second grade today. And they do this with accuracy. When I talk to principals, one of the things that is missing is, like for example, I talked to a group of eighth grade uh, middle school um, teachers. And I asked them, I said, are you in a constellation with the elementary schools that feed children to you? No. I just couldn't believe in the year 2004 that you have school districts where there's no communication between the middle school and the elementary schools. 
I said, now, if I were serious about the achievement gap at my middle school, I would seek to influence what the children look like when they get to me. And I would know something about them and seek to influence that. Well, the same thing goes for principals in elementary schools. I feel that the principal should know where their children are before they come to kindergarten and who they're with. And they should be in a constellation with those providers. I don't care if it's grandma that takes care of five children in her home. I don't care if it's Mrs. Hunter down the street, Head Start, any kind of child care or preschool facility that feeds children into my school, I will know those people. And I will seek to influence what those children look like before they enter my school. Now, I want to talk about the African American male. And I always try, when I'm talking to teachers, to sensitize particularly white teachers about how much at risk African American males are and how we need to think about how we can create school environments that support the learning styles and behavioral patterns of African American males. One of the things that we never think about as a society is how that black males comprise the largest proportion of people who are being incarcerated in the prisons in this country. So we're something like 13% of the population and maybe 48% of the prison population. Uh, we have more African American males between the ages of 18 and 22 in prison than we do in college. So we almost have to conceive of prison as an outcome of public education. And what no one ever talks about is the cost of incarcerating African American males. In the state of Michigan, it costs $35,000 to incarcerate an African American male for one year. If he is in a maximum security cell, it's $65,000 per year. If he is in the Atlanta Pen Federal Penitentiary for in a maximum security cell, it is $75,000 per year. But then, as Americans, we clamor to have children tried as adults, to extend the amount of time that people are in prison. And what, you know, and I'm not trying to say that we need to go let the people in prison out. I'm not trying to say that. Uh, Richard Pryor did a comedy show at Arizona State Penitentiary, and he said, thank God for prisons. He said, I asked one guy, well, did you have to kill everybody in the house? He said they was home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm not trying to say we need to let the b-boy prison out. What I'm trying to say is we know that we have social problems in our society. We can identify people who are at risk for going to prison. And it's really a choice whether we want to address those social problems on the front end of life or whether we want to address them on the back end of life. Um, and we see these second grade children who are off grade level, we can address it then when it's, I mean, it's just like what happened in New Orleans. They wouldn't fix the levees for a little bit of money. Now they have to have billions of dollars after the hurricane. That's the way we are. Then we won't address the problem when it's just a matter of sticking your finger in the dike. We wait till the whole thing collapses and then it's an insurmountable amount, um, amount of money. Now, I want to share with you Head Start. Head Start costs about $4,000 a year and the children go for two years, third grade, four, three years old, four years old, okay? So that's $8,000. We have longitudinal data that has been accumulated over a 35-year period where we have documented that children who go to Head Start just those two years are more likely to finish high school than non-Head Start children, more likely to obtain some kind of post-secondary education, less likely to become involved in teen pregnancy, less likely to become involved in the criminal justice system, but yet, of the children who are qualified for Head Start, only a minimal number are able to get it because they keep cutting the funding. 